So I, I picked a topic for Rosh Chodesh Adar, which slightly relates to um, Sefer Shmuel and our study, but more about Amalek, which we've discussed before. We did Amalek when we learned Shmuel Aleph, and Shosim with Amalek. Um, but I want to connect something with, with Amalek together with something from um, a little share on, on Parshat Shavua, or in Sefer Shmuel as well, just for in honor of um, Rosh Chodesh Adar. And we'll relate it later to Shmuel and, and David fighting Amalek and how he fights Amalek. So um, what I want to begin with is the Torah reading for Purim morning. Okay. Um, what do we learn on Purim morning? What, what Torah section do we read? Every, everyone knows Shabbat Zohar we read from Sefer Dvarim. What do we read on Purim morning? Yeah, from, yeah, from 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 Parsha B'Shalach, from chapter seventeen, the story of of Amalek. So I want to read that story first and talk about our victories. Just one one quick question to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, what enabled us to win the war against Amalek? It wasn't such an easy war. There was ups and downs. But what what enabled us to win the war? Moshe's Tefilo. No, according to the text. He kept his hands yeah, up. Moshe. Yeah, Moshe. Yeah, Moshe's hands. And everyone knows the Mishnah in, in Rosh Hashanah, right? Talks about when Moshe's hands were up, we would win. I mean, the Chumash says when Moshe's hands were up, we would win. When they were down, they were, they were, were, we'd lose. And the deeper understanding is that when they looked up and dedicated themselves to heaven, um, they would win. And if not, they would lose. Now, wh one other quick question. Um, have, do you know any stories or any um, historical evidence of people going to war with a banner. With a banner representing their their what they're fighting about or who they are. Do people like fight have flags when they fight or 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 symbols? Yeah. Not only is Always. it a thing, it's every army, every legion, remember, had a sign for the legion. Every unit in their army has its flag. And people rally around flags. If you know Iwo Jima, I think. The monument, they're waving the flag on top. There's a movie, The Patriot, where some guy waves a flag and rallies the troops. All the Civil War movies, everyone's fighting to hold the flag to rally the troops. Look, looking at the symbol of what you're fighting for is something that motivates troops. The question usually will be what, what the symbol is. Now, one last question, then we'll get started. Was it Moshe's hands? That were, what, what was in Moshe's hand? Was he just lifting his hand up like this? Like, re Asking a question, or did Moshe have something in his hand? Anyone remember? Just, just his hand. His he staff. had the mate. It, it was, it was just his hand, right? Yeah. The staff, the mate. Not the mate. Oh, very good, the mate, very good. Uh, but uh, that the mate is the right answer. Most people don't pay attention to that. Most people think because of the Mishnah that they think it's his hand, but lifting his hand up, looking at his hand. We're going to read the story carefully and see what he's holding, and we'll see what it will help us understand something, um, which will explain a lot of a lot of stories later in Chumash. Okay, so let's take a look at the. Both, it wasn't both his arms; it was only one. Um, it was a heavy staff. No, but I thought he had to keep both arms up. Did he because, not? Because he was probably holding it with both hands. It's it's much easier to hold something with one hand than with two hands, isn't it? Hold, hold two hands up. It's more difficult to keep your hands up holding something with two hands than with one hand. Right. I just thought that Joshua held up on both sides. Yeah. No, no. Joshua was down fighting. It was Aaron and Hor. Aaron and Hor held Hor up. were holding up his hands. hands. Okay. Okay. So let's go to, let's read the story in Perik Yudzayin and I'll share my screen. And all we really need today is a Chumash and a Tanakh, but I'll share my I'll miss real fast. And of course, here we are. Okay. We need from Exodus 17. Here we are. My screen's okay? Rabbi? No. All we see is Zoom. No, it's not okay. You don't I mean, see my screen. We, we can't I'll stop to share. Know. I'll try again. Here we are. How's that? Hold on, wait now. Schmutz uh, seven. Okay. Uh, 
good. Okay, yeah, yeah. So we're left Egypt. It's been several weeks. We've been traveling through the desert, and we just went back to chapter 17. Here we go. Um, Amisel travels from, from Midbarsin, and they get to Rafidim. And there's no water. Everyone knows they complain about the water. What are we going to do? And they cry to Moshe. Moshe cries to God. And we'll start with Pasek Hit. Hashem tells Moshe, walk in front of the people. Take some elders of Israel with you. The mate which you hit the Nile River with, take with your hand and walk. Take a walk from Rafidim to the Tzor and Chorev, which is Har Sinai. It's a day's walk. Hit the rock, and water will come out, and the people will drink. And Moshe does this in front of the eyes of, of the elders of Israel. And what needs to happen next? If the people are in Rafidim, and Moshe is the rock in Chorev, what needs to happen for the people to drink? Who can tell me? I'm sure you noticed this before, right? The, the, when Moshe is supposed to hit the rock, the rock is not in Rafidim where the people are. The people are dying of thirst in Rafidim. And Moshe is told to take a walk to Har Sinai, to Chorev, and hit the rock in Chorev, which gives water. What do you think the people are going to do? Walk to Chorev. Yeah. Well, some are, walk, some are going to run. Some are yeah. going to walk. Some are yeah. going to need help, aren't they? But mm -hmm. the whole camp is going to move to Chorev. But with pandemonium, it'll be a little wild, won't it be? It'll be. But just imagine everyone's dying of thirst. Rumor has it there's water in Chorev. The stronger people get there first, and um, and the rest of the camp will move slowly, but a bit unorganized. Keep that in mind. One other question, real fast. Um, is this true that Moshe's staff hit the hit the Nile River? Whose staff hit the Nile's river? Aaron. Is that what it says? Was it Moshe's staff or Aaron's staff? I think it was Aaron. Okay, so let's take a look in chapter 7, right? Chapter 7 in Shemot. Moses' staff, but Aaron did it. Ah, very good. Okay, read carefully, it's and this good. proves it. It's, it's unclear Moses. from here. Here. Um, here. Um, because Moses had gratitude to the Nile, so he couldn't hit the Nile. That's why he couldn't hit it, but whose staff is he here? Okay. Tell Aaron, Kach, your, your staff. Whose staff? Moshe's staff or his own staff? Yes. You understand the two ways to read it? This sounds like Aaron's staff. It sounds, but it could also be Moshe's staff. Uh, Tell Aaron, now it's, where did I put the quotation mark? Tell, it's, you know, do I need a quotation mark here? Without the quotation mark. It's, Tell Aaron to take your staff or his staff. It can go either way. But I can prove from, from our story, it's Moshe's staff. In a minute, you'll see why it's important. Okay? There's Moshe can hit, can hit the Nile because the Nile saved them for all the different reasons. But Aaron, Aaron can use Moshe's staff because Moshe's staff did all the otot as well, didn't it? But who did the otot with the mate? When Moshe and Aaron came back in chapter 5, remember? Or in chapter, yeah, at the end of chapter 4. At the end of chapter 4, when, when Moshe meets Aaron, okay, God told Aaron, go meet Moshe, okay? But I gave Moshe Aaron with Kitibri Hashem, Okay. He told Aaron all the things that God said him. Okay. 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 By Daber Aaron, it called Ashur Diber Hashem and Moshe. By Yasso Otot, Difne Am. Who did the Otot? Sounds like Aaron did the Otot in front of the people, didn't they? Didn't he? But he's using Moshe's staff. Remember? Moshe and Aaron go, they gather the elders of Israel. Aaron does the speaking, because that was that's what God told him. Aaron would speak on your behalf. Was all the things that God told Moshe to tell the people, Aaron said on his behalf. And it, in the singular, he did the otot in front of the Am. And the people then believed it. They trusted right? that God that God's redeeming them. But it seems like Aaron is using Moshe's staff to do the otot here as well. That's all. We'll, we'll keep that in mind. We'll see why it's important in a minute.
Now, let's go back to chapter 17. We were before. Back to chapter 17, and there we are. Okay. So we had the we had the people going to get the water. Okay. And then it says, by Malek, by Rufidim. Amalek comes, and where does he attack us? In Rufidim. Who's in Rufidim? Not Moshe and Yeshua and the elders. All the people are on their way from Rufidim, Tar Sinai. Who's back in Rufidim? The people who are weak, unable to travel quickly, waiting for other people to bring them water. So what we learn from here, when you read carefully between the lines, is that what's evil about Amalek is not just the fact of the first ones who attacked us, etc., but rather they're attacking us because we're unprotected. Right? We're tired, we're thirsty, we're run out. They don't attack the men. They attack the unprotected camp because all the men are are, are with Moshe and Harsinai and are getting water to bring back for the people who are weak and to slowly move the camp. But they're taking advantage of the pandemonium of walking to get water from Harsina. Okay. Now, listen carefully to Pasuk Teh. Boyamar Moshe el Yoshua, Bechar lanu anashim, anashim means man of war, that's just males, but, you know, get good soldiers. Remember, this is the first war Israel ever fights on their own. Fitzei hilachem b'amalek, go fight with Amalek. Machar onochi nitzab rosh ha-giva, omatei ehlohi b'yodi. Okay. Why fight tomorrow, not today? Simple shot, it's going to take a day to get back to Rafidim. Moshe is going to stand on top of a mountain. Okay? And what's in Moshe's hand? Umate Elohim Biyadi. How would you translate that? Here it says, Mate Elohim, it means God's staff. Does that make sense? What else could Elohim mean? Okay. It could be the powerful staff, right? I mean, it's given to him by God. But maybe it represents God, the mate that represents God, but that has power. What what did the mate do? The mate split the sea, didn't it? The mate has been doing miracles, split the sea, brought all the plagues, and now what's in Moshe's hand? Not his hand. His hand is holding up the mate Elohim. And therefore, when the people look at the mate Elohim, hear that by Yashu Shok Hashem Mar Lo Moshe, okay, and Aaron Chor go up the mountain, okay, by Yashu Yerim Moshe Yado. And what's the assumption? In Moshe's hand is what? The Mate Elohim. We won. And when he lowered it, we lost. Got it? And then Aaron Akhor helped them. And then they supported his hands, remember, until the evening. And Yeshua is able to defeat Amalek. Now, keep that in mind that this is the only battle they've ever fought on their own. This is the first battle they're fighting on their own. And, and then we get to Torah, and then Moshe goes up for 40 days on Har Sinai. Now, who remembers from a week ago, what did the people ask for when they thought Moshe isn't coming back? Yeah. Why are they asking for a God? The classic explanation of idol worship, meaning all of a sudden they want a different God, simply doesn't make sense because they believe in God. They know that God took them out of Egypt. Why would all of a sudden they want a different God? And what's that do with the fact that Moshe is not coming back? They believe in God. Moshe is a servant. But they don't need another God. What they want is, a, why do they want a power? Because they need to go and conquer Israel. Don't they? Now, if I go back to what, what God told them in Har Sinai, on the same, on the, the, day, the day after, the day of Har Sinai, the day of Matan Torah, the day after, if I open up, after the Torah was given, after the Ten Commandments were given, Moshe goes up to get more laws in Parsha Bishpatim. But in chapter 23, what are we told? We have all these laws, any with lots of Hashem, God tells Moshe to tell the people, remember, we're at Har Sinai, we're expected to go to Israel very soon. We don't know we're going to be so long in the desert. We left Egypt with the intention of on our way to Israel to conquer the land to set up a nation. In the meantime, we had all these experiences in the desert, and we just had war with Amalek, and we just get, got the Torah and entered a covenant to be God's people. But now God's saying, I'm going to send a Malach. We'll see if it's someone human or not. I'll send a, some messenger, some angel, 
what they call Syria, um, Lefanecha, to lead the way, to guard you on the way to bring you to the land of Israel, the place I got ready for you. You better listen to this Malach. Obey him. Don't rebel against him. Because this Malach can't forgive your sins. My name is with him. And we'll see in a minute why this has to be where everyone assumes it's Moshe. Kim Shema Tishma Bekolo. If you listen to what this Malach says, and hence do, and hence do what I'm saying, in other words, this Malach is speaking to you, giving you commands, but what he's saying is what I'm saying. In other words, if you obey this Malach and my commandments, then your enemies will be my enemies and your adversaries will be mine. Basically, I'll help you win the war. And finally, this Malach will lead the way in front of you and bring you to the land of Emori, Chiti, etc., and help you destroy it. Okay, that's God's promise. In the meantime, uh, if we go to chapter 24 real fast, Moshe comes down. Uh, Moshe comes and tells the people everything that God said, the laws and all these promises. The people agree to it. Moshe writes everything down. But what does he do in the morning? He gets up in the morning. He builds a mizbech, tacha tahar. He builds an altar at the bottom of the mountain. And 12 stones, the 12, 12 monuments, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Again, an altar in front of a symbol of Amisel's connection to God. He sends the people to bring olot and shlamim. They bring sacrifices, including shlamim, svachim shlamim, which people eat, parim, you know, from the best meat. Moshe takes half the blood, puts it in containers, and then Moshe takes the Sefer Abrit, reads it out loud, and the people answer the famous... Uh, the people answer, everything God said in a seven ishma. That's good old 24 seven ishmot. Moshe sprinkles the blood on the people. Remember, and this is the dam of the Brit. Then Moshe, Aaron, Adab, and Aviyu go up the mountain. And they see the God of Israel. They have some vision of God, this leadership group, including Aaron and the elders. And, and the bottom of God's feet is the brightest thing anybody could see. And even though they were able to see God, nothing happened to them. Hashem didn't punish them or didn't smite them. They witnessed, they visioned God, whatever that means, and they ate and they drank. Was that good or bad? Big machokin among the commentators, not our topic for today. But again, that's that's the kiddush they make, or that's the celebration they make when they accept the Torah at Har Sinai. And finally, there's more laws, and therefore God tells Moshe Rabbeinu, come up the mountain and be there by Yesham. I'll give you the Chot Evan, the Torah and the Mitzvah, which I'm writing for you to teach them. Moshe goes up, and here's our key pasuk. He tells the elders, stay here until I come back. I'm going up with Yeshua. Stay here until I come back. Any questions? Aaron and Chor, which goes back to the story of Amalek, we gave before. They're Moshe's helpers. Now they'll be the babysitters. Anyone with questions or problems goes to Aaron and Chor, and Moshe goes up the mountain. And finally, what do the people see? The people see this vision of God, God's glory, on like burning fire on top of the mountain. That's what the people view. And Moshe goes into the Anan, goes up the mountain, and then Chumash tells us that Moshe was there for 40 days and 40 nights, and we'll stop here for a minute. Now, I want to tie the story of Amalek here to what happens with Chet Egel. I'll try, I'll try to explain the connection. Um, The people are going to wait a week, won't they? They'll wait a couple of days, they'll wait a week. Are they going to wait 100 years or 50 years? What would you say? They're not going to wait forever. I don't think they're going to wait even a year. They'll wait a week or two or three. Sometime between a couple of weeks and a year, what conclusion are the people going to reach if he doesn't come down? He's not coming down. That should be obvious, right? And God's leaving him there on purpose, it seems like. He wants to see how the people are going to behave now with Moshe gone. Now, assuming Moshe is not coming back, which is a very logical assumption, because remember, the people didn't have Rashi back then. I mean, they didn't know. It's, we know, the Chumash tells us that Moshe is there for four days and 40 nights. But Moshe didn't tell them. Aaron doesn't know. The people don't know. And they're reaching a logical conclusion that Moshe is not coming back because he didn't come back. Now, someone tell me, what options do we have as a nation? We'll leave the leadership alone for now. As a nation, whoever the leader might be, what are Amisar's options, assuming Moshe's not coming back? 
Rabbi, where is this powerful staff? Is the powerful staff up on Har Sinai with Moshe, or is the powerful staff down there with, uh, I don't know, Aaron or something like that? I, I, Maybe I, think, they, I, I think Moshe has a power staff with him. Okay, so then they want something that's that's going to work like the powerful staff did. And exactly. they able it becomes that. That's exactly what I want to show you. In other words, what are their options? They can't stay in the desert forever. There's no point in staying in the desert forever. They won't want to either. Going back to Egypt is problematic because they don't want to go back to slavery. They don't want to return all the money they took either. But going to Israel is problematic because you have to conquer the land and the land and the enemy is strong. But God promised them miraculous help conquering the land. They thought that Moshe would be the leader taking them to Israel. Now that Moshe is gone, what do they need? They don't just need a leader. They need a powerful tool to help them conquer the land. Because what's Moshe to them? That's just a miracle worker. Moshe helped them fight all their battles. He split the sea. He brought the plagues. He punished the Egyptians. Everyone was assuming that Moshe was this malak that God sending to help them defeat Canaan. Now that Moshe's not there, they need a replacement. Not just for Moshe, but we need that powerful tool that helps us defeat the Canaanite nations. Who do they go to? They go to Aaron. Listen carefully what the people tell Aaron. We're now in, we're going to move now to chapter 32, right? The story of Chete Egel. And look how much sense it makes now. We're back to chapter 32. And watch what happens. Okay. The people here don't see, they understand. All through the story, follow the word Vayar, like in English. When you see, if you see my point, you see what they mean. To see means to reach an understanding. The people don't see anything, but they realize that Moshe is not coming down. Moshe is delayed in coming down from the mountain. And the people gather upon Aaron, who's obviously the next leader. The Amru'i love. What did they tell him? That's what's key. They don't ask for a God. They ask for a power that will lead the way. Why? Because who is supposed to be that power? Moshe and his staff. Now that Moshe is not coming down and we don't have a staff, we need something to replace that. Why? Moshe, the mortal, okay, who took us out of Egypt and helped us defeat the Egyptians. We don't know what happened to him. And therefore, we need a replacement. They believe in the same God. They need a replacement. We need something to help us conquer the land. That's why Asher Yechul Faneinu is the key phrase. Now, the last time they fought a war, and the only time they ever fought a war, was against Amalek. And what helped them win the war? The Mate Elohim in Moshe's hand. What do they want now? They want a power that will lead the way. But they're interested in, they want a powerful tool that will help them conquer the land of Israel. And therefore, they go to Aaron. Aaron didn't say no. He agrees with them. Aaron says, "What? Give me your gold." Remember them, Aaron. Notes. Bring me your gold. The people take off their gold. They bring it to Aaron. Okay. Listen carefully. By Kachmi Adam, Aaron takes the gold. He forms it into a mold. Okay. Aaron makes the egel. Abasecha is representing something. Aaron makes an egel representing our God or a symbol of God or power, okay? And what do the people say? This item that Aaron made, right, is representing the God of Israel who took us out of Egypt, who's going to bring us to Israel. But right beforehand, they just said Moshe took him out of Egypt, right? And Pasakal said, Moshe took us out of Egypt, representing God, and now that Moshe's not there, this is a replacement for Moshe, not a replacement for God. But not just replacement for Moshe, but Moshe and his powerful staff we're going to lead them to Israel. Okay? To make sure it's not misunderstood, what does Aaron do? Aaron sees what's happening. It was his idea. He's going to make the same celebration like we had in our Sinai to emphasize that this Egeo is representing God and our dedication to God. Tomorrow we're going to have a celebration to God just like we did at Har Sinai. In other words, to emphasize this is representing the God of Har Sinai. He's going to make a celebration just like Har Sinai with the altar in front of a symbol of God, bringing a lot in Shlamim. 
Therefore, by Ashkimu Mimocharat, they get up the next morning, they bring Olot in Shlamim, just like our Sinai. They sit down to eat and drink, and then the big difference is, by Yikum Tzachek, that's where all the Parshanim put this in. Now, pay attention. God doesn't tell Moshe to go down on the day that Aaron makes the Egel, does he? When Aaron makes the Egel, God says, doesn't do anything. Um, Aaron definitely means well, and the Chag is for Hashem, remember? Chag Lut Kevav Kemachar. No one believes in any other God. It's all about the God of Israel. And Aaron has great intentions, but something goes wrong at the party. At the celebration, things go wild. Now, what went wild, we'll see in a minute. But all I want to show you now is that if I want to understand what Aaron's doing and what the people want, they want to go conquer the land of Israel. They need miraculous help. And they're asking Aaron to do something that will give us a tool to win the war. Just like the Matel Luhim, held by Moshe, helped us defeat Amalek. I need something similar. Aaron thinks an ego is a good idea. Now, just a quick time out. Um, everyone know, give me some classic explanations why he makes an egel to represent God. Someone, I think, mentioned it before. Remember the famous Kiskuni? Who knows why an egel would be a good symbol of God for the people? Of what happened to Har Sinai? When they saw Hashem, the feet of the yeah, ground. Who saw God? Only the leadership, right? Right. And they saw the bottom of his feet which was the shiniest thing. Remember, Moshe sees God panim b'fanim. That's the highest level. Seeing the bottom of God's feet is the lowest level, whatever that means. But it's, it's a description of a level of understanding God. But the lowest level of God for them was the brightest thing you could see. Now, Yechezkel has a similar vision of God, but much more complicated. And in Yechezkel, Perak Allah, Pasek Vav, it says the bottom of God's feet, of, of, the, of, the, of God's chariot, look like the, the feet of um of of an egg. What is it? Uh, I'll just show you the pasuk real fast. I want to take a quick look in Yechezkel for those who don't remember. Um, where are we? Yechezkel. What happened here? No Bible. Okay. Oh, here we are. Bible. We read this in the morning on Shavuos. Remember, he has this big vision. Okay, he has this vision of a big storm. Okay, and there's four. Different animals he sees. One of them looks like a human. Four faces. And then what happens? The feet are straight of all these animals, or whatever this vision is, are straight. The bottom of the feet are like, look like the bottom of the feet of an ego. And they're shiny, like, like burnished brass. Now, if, if the elders saw Tachat Raglav, and here Tachat Raglav is shiny, like brass, but looking like the foot of an egel. So that's what a lot of Parshim say, that's why Aaron makes the egel. It means well. It, it, re, it reminds them of what they saw in Harsina, whatever that means. In other words, not that God has feet, but rather this vision appeared to them. They, they, made, they made this calf to remind them of the vision they had at Harsina. All we need to show is that Aaron has good intentions, He's making a symbol of God. Now, in the eyes of the people, what did this symbol mean to them? We're going to, we have God's help now to help us defeat and conquer the nations of Canaan. Now, I want to use three words to try to explain what's happening. It's clearly not idol worship, I-D-O-L. Idol worship for sure not. I'll, I'll write the, um, let me use a whiteboard. I haven't used that in a long time. Whiteboard. We write text now, okay? Text is this guy, okay? Can we can have idol worship? I think it's not, right? I'll put a big X there. It can't be that because they believe in God and Aaron's doing it, okay? Now, some people claim it's idol worship. It means it's pointless. Not good or bad, it's just wasting your time, but it's idol worship. I want to claim... Call it ideal worship, meaning ideal here is an adjective. Wait, I didn't mean that. Okay. Ideal meaning, let me get a, here we go. And a little, no, I don't want that. I want to draw. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Here. I want to use ideal in Aaron's eyes. 
this is an ideal way to serve God, to represent God. And the people are going to turn this into a noun. What I call ideal worship. Not an adjective, but a noun meaning. Okay? The ideal of having a, a superpower to conquer my nations and defeat my enemies, that's going to be what they're worshiping. It's not, no, it's, we're going to have a symbol of God. What the symbol of God means to them is not the God they're representing, the God whose stars they're keeping, but rather the God who's the military might who's going to help them defeat their enemies. Okay? They, they see this flag or this, you know, this symbol of God, and what's it mean to them? If you saw the movie, The Raiders of the Lost Ark, I don't have to explain it anymore. We want this magical thing here that can defeat our enemies, and they're so happy and crazy about it. Wow, we have the best tanks, the best, you know, we have the best munitions. We can defeat any, we can be the, you know, the new superpower in the Middle East because we have God's power with us. As opposed to a symbol of being a mamlechet koni begoy kadosh, the symbol of God should be a symbol of what we're about as a nation, our goal as a nation. Instead, it becomes a very narrow symbol of a God who helps to be win wars as opposed to a God that I'm serving, basically a God working for me instead of me working for a God. Which causes them to be a big, set, like they have a big party, they have a big celebration, they, and they drink and they go wild. Remember by Kimbal Tzachek. Now, what does it mean to doing wrong? There's definitely the by Kimbal Tzachek, this, whatever this laughter is, or frivolous behavior is, is bad. But if you look what God tells Moshe Rabbeinu, it's definitely not idol worship. Listen to what he tells them. Let me just check the chat real fast. If I missed something in the chat. Ah, so Annie writes, the people knew 40 days and 40 nights. No, I, that's why I said Annie. Rashi says that. All the other Parshim don't say that. In simple shot, no one knows it's going to be 40 days and 40 nights. Rashi makes a beautiful drash on Bashesh, meaning Moshe is supposed to come in six hours and they mixed up by a day or a couple hours. That's a beautiful midrash about having a little more patience an extra day or an extra couple hours. But in shot. They have no idea when he's coming back. No one has any idea when he's coming back. And we'll see, Moshe himself doesn't come back until, until God tells him to go down. He would have been up there longer. God's waiting for something to happen. Because God's testing what's their behavior going to be after all these, um, what their behavior is going to be like with Moshe not there. The question is, was this two-month seminar of all the events since they left Egypt, the, the plagues, splitting the sea, the manna, uh, what happened in Mara, what happened with Amalek, are those events going to affect how they behave? Or you know, are they going to be now dedicated to be in the service of God? Or are they going to go astray again? They might believe in God and God's going to work for them and defeat their enemies, but is that all they care about? Or is there more? And you can test that by their behavior, how they party. Remember, because I'll say, how do you judge a person? A person? No, it's, you judge a person by how he drinks, um, uh, what he does with his money, and what happens when he gets angry. But we're checking the people's behavior, um, how they're going to behave at the party. I'll give a better analogy in a minute, which you probably won't like. Um, let's see what happened. What God tells Moshe Rabbeinu. Go back to our... Our text in Shemot. We're in chapter 32, right? Pasuk Zion, verse 7. Okay. By that Hashem HaMoshe, Lech red ki sheichet amcha. Asher lecham eres Mitzrayim. What does this mean? Lech red ki sheichet amcha. Where have we had this word before? Because what is hashkata? It says here in English, um, for the people have dealt corruptly. Okay, Where, where's, why is Hashkata corruption? Anyone have a good source? Where's the first time we have the concept of Hashkata? The Mabul. Yeah, and remember oh. what it says by the Mabul? We'll share our screen again. It's not idol worship, that's for sure. What is it? I'm sorry, I should have reshared my screen. If I go back to Brishit, are we? Um, let me get another window open. Oh, I'll just open up this window here. Exodus, here we go. Bible. Exactly. Chapter 6, the beginning of the flood story. Uh, first, let's just go through a couple of them. Um, the man is what he called. Um, their behavior is really bad. Um, I'm sorry, chapter 6 I need. Chapter 6, that's chapter 7, chapter 6, here we go. Um, their behavior is bad. 
God sees that Rabba Rat Adam, they're thinking bad things all the time. And Eilatod Noach, here's what we need. Here's Hashkata the first time. But Tishacheta Aretz Lifnei Elohim, but Timelech Hamas. Hamas, unfortunately, we see like from today, that's their, their name for a different reason. But Hamas in Hebrew is corruption and violence. Right? That's not idol worship. That's bad behavior. That's corruption, stealing, hitting. It's simply bad behavior. And as long as we have Sefer Bashid open, I want to go back to a definition of what Derech Hashem means, which we've seen a thousand times. Remember when Avram is chosen, or when God talks to Avram about stone, Avram is going to be a great nation. Because I, I came to know him why. Listen carefully. The man asher yitzaved banav v'bitoach harav, v'shamru et derech Hashem l'asot tzedek v'mishpah. We were chosen by God to have a family tradition of doing derech Hashem here. Let me make the definition super clear. According to Chumash, derech Hashem v'alach t'bidrachav, derech Hashem is doing justice and righteousness. Now, let's go back now to Shmot, where we had before. Back to our story, chapter 32. Look carefully what God says. He says, Lech red ki shechetamcha. Okay. Saru maher min aderach asher tzibitim. What's a derach asher tzibitim? That's not idol worship. That's proper behavior. That's derach Hashem. Balach de bidrachav. So each thing is bad. Shechet is corrupt behavior. Derach Hashem is lack of moral behavior. Okay. They made an ego masecha. They made an ego representing God. But instead of a symbol of what of the God they're serving, instead, they don't daven at the kotel, they daven to the kotel. They, they, they're davening not to God, the ego doesn't mean to them God is representing, but they're bowing down to the power it represents. They're bowing down to the ego. And they say, oh wow, this is our power. This is the power of Israel. The same power, that, you know, they're seeing very selectively those same miraculous, powerful events beating our enemies. What God did to Egypt, this ego is going to do that to our, to our, to the nations of Canaan. But what, what I'm getting at is that in this celebration, which Aaron had really good intentions for, things go wild, and then we see where their culture is. I'm going to give you an example which you, you won't like, but you'll probably appreciate. I call it modern Orthodox weddings. I mean, hope, hope no one gets offended. Um, there's the first dance at a wedding, which has what? There's a mechitza usually. The music is Jewish. Um, the rabbis are there dancing with Scott Stark. Everyone's doing, everything's fine. Right? Two hours later, uh, there's no, um, there's what's called the second dance or the third dance. Um, there's no, all, all the older people are gone or the rabbis are all gone for sure. There's no mechitza. The dancing isn't only separate anymore. Uh, the music is totally goyish. And you see the real culture of the people. I'm not saying wrong or right, whatever it is. I'm sure you've been to weddings like that. that that's, that's our culture, isn't it? I'm not saying good or bad, whatever it is. If you want an indicator where people's hearts are and what their behavior is, look what happens when they're having a good time, having a party, and dancing and singing. Right? What, what, what are they singing about? What, what, what's their default behavior? And once the bar's open, right? And all of a sudden, the music is no longer Jewish music. And the dancing is not exactly yeshiva dancing. And again, I'm saying every wedding is that way. But, and I'm saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's an indicator. People's behavior at a party gives an indication of where they're at in life. Where the goals are, where they're going. Now, God's goal is not only for the Jews to be living in Israel. God's goal is to be a nation representing God in Israel. God can't bring them into the land until they're educated, until they're prepared spiritually to be God's people. He's going to help them conquer the land. The question, how are they going to act once it's conquered? What does God see from the story of the Ego? They didn't graduate Harsina yet. I need maybe another one last example. I call it Benaz Manim Sukkos, or, or like you can have a real strong Elohim in Yeshiva. I'm used to teaching 18 year olds. You can take like, you no. Know, Regular dummy high school kids, they come to Israel, get really pumped, they get really, what's called, you know, really dedicated. They have a great Elozman, great Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. They're on a spiritual high. And a week later, during Cholom Sukkot, they're back to their high school behavior again. Now, not all of them, but things like that happen. 
Be- because when when education goes too quick and too sudden, and not done properly or not done, you know, maybe not enough time, people revert back to their old culture. And we know from Micheska, we know from for good reason. In Egypt, our culture was Egyptian. We didn't have any Torah beforehand. It only makes sense we had Egyptian culture, and therefore they're reverting to it. And then God sees now they're not ready yet to serve Him. So now I'm going to show you this in the Psukim. What does God tell Moshe Rabbeinu next? Um, where are we? Um, what happened? Okay, so God tells Moshe Rabbeinu what they did wrong. Then, what conclusion does God reach? The people are in Amksha Ora. What does it mean they're stubborn? If you have a stiff neck, you can't change. You can't change your behavior. We think, I tried to change them. They're not changing. They're not educated. They're not edu- What's called? You can't educate them. You can't change them. They're stiff necked. Let me make it now allow me. He's sort of begging Moshe to Davin. But let me get kindle my anger against them. Let me consume them, punish them. I'll make a nation out of you or people like you, maybe Shevet Levi. Let me make a nation of people who are perfect who don't sin. Of course, Moshe is going to daven. What you gain will be a chilo Hashem, etc. He talks about Britavot, about chilo Hashem, etc. And God listens to him. Doesn't kill them, but later he'll, Moshe has to negotiate a new covenant. When Moshe goes down, and he sees, and when before he goes down, Yeshua hears kolot, remember? He hears loud noise on the mountain. He thinks there's a war going on. And Moshe tells him, that's not the sound of war. That's simply a sound of wild noise. That's all. It's not a, not the stories of, of uh, victors and losers. It's not the classic sounds of war you're hearing. It's just a wild party. Just just loud, loud noise and screaming. Typical of a, of a wild party. When he comes, he sees not just the ego, also the mecholot, the dancing around it. Remember the old line here, everything leads to mixed dancing. And Moshe gets angry, breaks the luchot. Burns the ego, all the sota type of imagery we're familiar with. And look what happens next. Pasach of Aleph. Remember Moshe El Aaron? He doesn't accuse Aaron of sinning. He says, What did you do that you caused him to sin? Aaron meant well. So, how did this happen? What went wrong? Aaron's answer is simple. He says, what, Are you surprised? I'm Aaron. You know the people, you know the campers, they've been bad. What did you expect was going to happen? And he says, it's your fault. Okay? They said, they told me, make this power, which will lead the way. Why? Because you didn't come back. And it's your fault. You didn't come back. I had to do something. And that's what I did. And then, you know, so I, I collected the gold. I did what I did. And this here's what happened. I think this is, this is not what happened, but it's a summary of what happened. I made the fire and this is the ego I made. And what's Moshe's conclusion? Not that it was idol worship, but rather, He sees the people are wild. Paro means wild. Aaron got them wild. Paro Aaron, which they have wordplay here with the word paro, back to Egyptian culture, to their disgrace. Then we have to find out who spiked the drinks, who changed the music, who are the troublemakers, and then he has to ask for forgiveness, etc. That's already the long story of Chetayel. What, what I want to claim is, is that if I want to understand the story of Chet Ego, it's another t- one, it's a final test where God's checking, are the people ready yet to be God's people? And God sees from their behavior, they're not ready yet. Now, in theory, God could say, you know what, let's make a nation out of perfect people like Moshe Rabbeinu would forget normal people. And Moshe is going to argue, you chose the nation, you have to realize we're human, we make mistakes. It takes a long time till we learn. We need a new covenant with God's attributes of mercy. Just like before the flood and after the flood, we have a new covenant after the flood where God's more forgiving, understanding that we're not bad all the time, but we can learn from our mistakes. Same thing now, God's going to introduce now uh, is attributes of mercy, which enable man to make up for their sins. So I just want to share with you this idea that from the first word of Amalek, again, the topic's not Amalek. I was using the Amalek story to understand a little deeper, a little better, what happened in the story of Chet Ego. So if I want to appreciate why on the one hand it can't be idol worship, I-D-O-L, because that's simply impossible, but it can't be, just be a mistaken image of God. It's how you view that image of God, and what it means to you, which is important. And when God promises to give you military help, it's in order to achieve your goal to be God's nation. 
when your whole view of God's military help is your goal, and your goal is you know, just think military strength, and you're not going to act properly, and you're not going to act in a way that sanctifies God once he gives you that military strength, then there's no point for God to help you conquer the land. And therefore, Moshe is telling the people, and God's telling Moshe, this nation is not going to work. Moshe has to negotiate a new contract where God's more forgiving, but we're still we're going to need to a, a rehab project called the Mishkan to uh, to fix it. Now, later on, if I follow Chazal, the commandment of the Mishkan is after Chet Egel. What's going to replace the Egel? The Aron. Because the Aron is made out of all the gold the people collect. We, we're going to make basically a kosher Egel now. What's going to lead them to war? Just a quick reminder. Once they build the Mishkan, um, we have the Aron with the Kruvim, etc. Our symbol of God now is going to be a symbol that... Um, a second. Our symbol of God is going to be made out of gold that the people collect. It's Parsha Bayaka. We collect all the gold and silver. But after it's all ready and we're ready to go to Israel, everyone knows this Pasuk by heart. We get everything ready to go to Israel in chapter 10. Um, we have the Chatzot etc. We have a tour guide with uh, Chovav. We're ready to travel. And finally, we have all the Machanot ready. And then... We leave our Sinai by Sumi Har Hashem. We leave Mount Sinai, three day distance. Baron Brit Hashem no Seli Fnehem. What leads the way of Am Yisrael to battle, to conquer Israel? The Aron, the symbol of God now, is going to be our covenant with God. Okay? And by even so, Aron, when the Aron would get up to make sure that it was a proper symbol of God leading them battle, Kum Hashem Vecha, Our new symbol of God will be the Aron. Which will help us defeat our enemies, and when we when we rest from fighting, Shuvah Hashem before Tafay Yisrael. Hashem here is referring to the Aron. So we see that basically the Aron is going to serve the same purpose as Aron's original Avamina for the Egel. It's now it's a better symbol of God that reminds us of commitment of the laws in the Aron, the Sefer Torah. Now our symbol of God can easily be misunderstood, and therefore we're going to cover it. It's called the Mishkan. We have a symbol of God, which has the luchot, the covenant, our commitment to God, following His laws, the laws, the Sefer Torah with it, to make sure it's not, um, it becomes a God, we cover it. That's called the covering, it's also later called the Mishkan, on top of it. We know it's there, but we can't see it. Also represents a lot. Um, and if, when we go and conquer Yericho, the Aron leads the battle, helps us win the war in a miraculous way. But it works when, when the Kony were building the Shofrot and when it comes with education and understanding. Um, several decades later, or almost over 100 years later, Amisa is going to war against the Plishtim and the, um, they're fighting in the area of Shiloh. And the rabbis into the, the Kohanim in Shiloh decide to take the Aron to battle. Now, who's doing that? The people leading, the Kohanim leading the people in the Mishkan and Shiloh are all corrupt. Remember, at least two sons. Pure corruption. In running the Mishkan, they think that taking the Aron to battle could help them win a war. But to them, the Aron is simply a symbol of God's power. And what happens? They lose the battle. And the Aron's taken captive. But that's the example when the Aron's miss when, when the Aron is a symbol of God's power, but not of what, how we have to behave to be worthy of God's help. It's not going to help you. If the Aron is a symbol of what it's representing, therefore when Moshe's hands are up holding the staff of God, remembering why we're chosen as a nation, we win. That's what the mission Rosh Hashanah is talking about. And, and when the symbol of God is misunderstood, when it's a symbol of power and only power, and not how you need to behave to be deserving of God's help, then it's not going to work. There's a need for symbolism. There's a need for an a icon, something representing of your chosenness. But our symbol of God has to be our covenant with God, the Torah, the Brit, of, of, um, of how we have to behave and why we're chosen and the laws that come with it in Parsha Mishpatim, in the Torah, etc. <clears throat> if that's representing what you're fighting for, then God's there to help you. If you're only, if you use this as some magical icon, some amulet kind of idea, something magical that's going to help you win more because you got this magic thing on your side, then it's not going to work. 
And that's it, it's not just a problem with Chet Egel, it's a problem throughout Jewish history. Of You need symbols of God to remember your connection to God. When the symbols of God become a God, and you only care about what's in it for you, but not what not your responsibility, but rather what privilege you get from it, that's when the symbols get misunderstood. And so I gave the example. It's wonderful to dive in at the Kotel and what it represents. When you dive in to the Kotel, that becomes problematic. You can dive in at a grave, but not to a grave. And, and that's a classic problem of idol worship, which isn't serving another God, it's serving the right God the wrong way. But it's not just a mis it's not a theological misunderstanding. It's a behavioral problem. Of, of it's a misunderstanding of, of the purpose of chosenness and what that means and how that affects your behavior. Um, I wanted to do a I wanted to get to David in Amalek, but that's not going to get I'm not going to have time for that. Let me check the chat real fast and see the questions. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, something froze. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Haven't seen that long. Wait. Oh, no, Judy says okay, that thing. Oh, that was this. Okay. So authentic Judaism is frozen in Eastern European culture, or do we evolve? Uh, Lee, I'm not sure what your question is. I'll read this question. Authentic Judaism is frozen in Eastern European culture, or do we evolve in our current cultural? Where's Lee? Lee, I didn't understand the question too well. It was really not a question. It was a comment on your uh, about dancing at weddings. Oh, I mean, no, okay, I got you. Okay, fine. <laughs> That was just an, I'm just giving an analogy of, of human nature. That's all. Um, that's okay. Okay. Um, okay. Annie wrote, so the idea that people first went to Khor to help make the egg out, that's a beautiful midrash, which makes sense, but it's a midrash. It doesn't say anything about Khor. I'm giving a wider explanation that fits into the whole theme of Chumash. Now, it's interesting that Aaron and Khor left to be in charge, and Karl Khor was a big leader, and after the story, he disappears. So it's a beautiful Midrash explaining why Khor why disappears and why Aaron gave in to the request. But I still think I can explain the whole story with, without needing that. I don't need Aaron acting out of fear that he's going to get punished or the people are going to gang up on him. I, I, I think Aaron's intentions are good because he thinks it's ideal worship. You need a symbol of God. It's logical. It's, it's a good idea to have something like that. But when it gets misunderstood, that's when it's bad. But I have to bring examples of day-to-day -day Judaism where we have very important symbols of God and they become amulets and you get Madonna Kabbalah instead of, you know, all of a sudden mezuzahs have magical powers and things like that instead of the laws in the mezuzah that it's representing. It's, it's a classic problem of religion when it's misunderstood. Okay. If the aren't supposed to go to magical, why does God send a plague? And that's another thing. God wants, God wants the Aaron being taken as a wake-up. That's exactly what happens. I'll take Shelley's question. What happens? If there's to be a um, multi-purpose in what's happening in God's punishment, but after the loan is taken, it's going to be the wake-up call. Now, the loan taken, taken captive, is going to. It'll be so um, extreme. It's going to lead the people to do tshuva. If I go back to Sefer Shmuel, which we finally got to today. It's our big topic. Um, Chapter six, right? The yeah, beginning of chapter seven. Of oh, the end of chapter six first. Um they brought the Aaron. Remember the, the Aaron, they mistreated in Beit Shemesh as well. Remember, they're so happy with the they saw it, but misunderstood it again. And they send it finally to Kirati Arim. But look how chapter seven begins. Okay. Kirat, the people in character and bring the Aaron to the Giva. Here. Pasik bet. Bahim Yom Shebet. What sparks the return? By now, I think it's Anmanapia, like the people are fetching or they're sighing. But it was so severe what happened. The punishment, the, the loss of the battle of Mishtim, the Shiloh being destroyed, the Mishkan being destroyed, the Rum being taken captive, that was a wake up call to the nation. And luckily, they had a, had a leader, a religious leader, who was able to turn that tragedy into a tshuva movement. And Shmuel tells the people, okay, if this is real tshuva, if this is real, or you just have remorse that you lost the battle, or you have remorse and you want to change your ways and realize what you've been doing wrong. So if you have real remorse with your heart, okay, get rid of all your foreign gods in your midst, okay, and prepare your heart to serve God by himself. No more syncretism. And then he can save you from the Pushtim. You want God to help you? 
Don't think it's something magical. Bring your hearts back and serve God properly. Pro serve God properly, and then He can help you from the police team. And sure enough, the people get rid of the idol worship. And then Shmuel says, "That's not enough. We have to have an educational gathering in mitzvah. Remember, they'll pray for them. They gather in mitzvah. They pour water, and by they fast on that day. They admit their sins. We say tachnu. They admit their sins, and Moshe judges their behavior in mitzvah." And then that leads to the next board, and then we then we defeat the police team. So if I go back to your chat question, um, God sends God's going to use that defeat and that everyone being taken captive as a catalyst. But luckily, we had a good leader called Shmuel who was able to capitalize on that remorse that people have and the regret that people have to turn that around into proper chuva and turn it into something educational. Um, Rabbi, are yeah. they what are they doing teshuva for? Are they doing teshuva for worshiping the Baal and the Ashtay wrote, or are they doing teshuva because of the behavior that comes from it, the fertility it, it, right? It, yeah, in my opinion, right? it's the same idea because what is Baal worship? Baal worship is I serve a god because I want rain. Baal is a rain god, I serve as a fertility god. When people need rain, people need uh, um, the agriculture to grow. But if I believe in agricultural gods, so I pray to God that my crops are successful. I pray to God for prosperity. I pray to the prosperity God. In Chumash, we say, there is no many gods. There's one God in charge of all the powers of nature. But he judges you based on your behavior. So I pray to remember that there's only one God, and that God judges us and takes care of our agriculture and our prosperity and our safety and our security based on our behavior. That's a transformative understanding that shapes how you behave. And therefore, behavior and idol worship go hand in hand. And when you're serving God only because what's in it for you, if, if you serve, if you believe in the God of Israel, but you're only praying to him for rain or for prosperity or for nachas, but that prayer, but you don't realize that God can be can give you that. But it's not a function of your prayers, it's a function of your deeds and your behavior. Then God says, that's prayers I'm not going to answer. You've turned God into a, You've turned your God into idol worship. So I don't think there's a difference between serving other gods and and, and moral behavior. They go hand in hand. Um, someone says mixed dancing was very common. It's like mixed dancing with what do you call it? That was just a joke being to mixed dancing. Um that was just that was just old um something always gonna lead to something bad. But that that's not that wasn't the main problem. Question of the dancing of who they're dancing with, that's something else. Um, oh, we're judged again as a group. Oh, God always judges us as a group, not there's individual role in punishment, but all the judgment in the Bible is our group behavior. Therefore, we're all responsible so for each other. That leads to the possibility that you could be doing right, but the nation is wrong and it doesn't help you. You get schmice just uh, maybe as worse than, than somebody else if you're so at the wrong they, uh, it can be. It can go to your advantage when things go good and go against you when things go bad. Uh, the example I like to bring is recycling. Let's say Come that on, recycling. Let's be realistic. It always went to your disadvantage. Okay, whatever it, it could go, but if if you're part of a nation, you're responsible for other people's bad behavior. So if someone's being machalo shabbos, you throw rocks at him to save yourself. They, they weren't living in Malaya Dumim or that. They were living on their farms. They had no idea what their neighbors were doing. They were living a quiet life. Judaism didn't take up much time, a few sacrifices, and aliyot, uh, baregel every once in a while. They did their own shechting. They did their own stuff. It, it didn't take up a lot of time or headspace. No, but the Judaism wasn't, wasn't bringing sacrifices. The Judaism was what you do with your prosperity, what type of community you build, what you do with the people in need in your community. I mean, the, the, Judaism is practiced in the home, at the workplace. The, the the Judaism isn't God doesn't need to be fed. You come to the temple to remember how you need to behave when you leave the but, temple. But what Judaism was done in the home biblically? That's what I'm saying. There wasn't learning. There was maybe there was challah. Maybe there wasn't. You did your own we, chef. No, but it's, 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 it's your behavior. Why isn't living, living a just life? Why isn't that in Judaism? You're talking about Judaism, the religion. I'm talking about Judaism, the way of life. It's called Derech Hashem. And it, but as a way of life, you didn't interact with that many people. You were a farmer. You didn't hire that many people. It was... Okay, that, I, I don't know. That you have to ask God. I'm saying, but that, that's what God's demanding. I'm saying, what, what, what I'm getting at is that 
um, you, you, we're judged as a community, as a group, and we have communal responsibility for good or for bad. But the example I wanted to bring was with recycling. If, if recycling is true, and if everyone recycles, we'll save the planet. And if no one recycles, we'll get you know, tidal waves and everything will be destroyed. So let's say 20% of the people recycle and 80% don't, and that's not enough. So when the tidal waves come and the weather and all the catastrophes happen, it was going to punish, it's going to hurt the people recycled as well as the people who didn't recycle. I think your analogy is backwards. Most of the people didn't offend God, didn't do anything wrong. The elites and the city dwellers, which were a minority, may have, uh, because they came in contact with other cultures, done it. Amcha, I think, was just simple folk. and uh, But because the elites were the ones in, uh, doing the political shenanigans uh, and the rest of it, you got schmeiss because of them, and they were the minority, not the majority. It could be. That's what got. Like we have people think that way nowadays. It's always the government's fault. That the people are fine, the government's bad. They're blamed for everything. It's a lot to it. <laughs> in in general, everyone's to blame. The people are to blame. Leadership's to blame. We always blame other people. But it's uh, what exactly happened? But God has expectations to be a nation representing God in our behavior, and we have lots of rituals we do to remember that. But the main way we serve God is by the, the 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 society that we build, the community that we build, and we need the mitzvot to remember what why we're chosen, and you need to gather together to remember our, our to keep the tradition going. Anyway, but the idea of hashkacha, that's a the one that questions on that. Read Yov. he's probably the best. He has the best explanation why there's no answer to the question. Already, anyway, Rabbi J, have any, any announcements, Rabbi? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, tomorrow night, uh, Mark Shapiro is restarting his uh, new series on the Musser movement, the uh, dispute over the bringing in of Musser and the actual study of uh, it's exactly what you're talking about, improvement, you know, what doing what we're supposed to do. And uh, that created a huge dispute in the 19th century. So uh, that's um, Dr. Mark yeah. will be back. Wait, 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 Jay, there's one other question I didn't get to. Um, one, source sheet, I didn't because I've been traveling this week. I didn't have time to make a source sheet. I was on the road the whole time. Um, and, but I'll make up a, I'll give a source sheet. I'll, I'll give a review sheet of this. I'll give it for, for the website for next week. Yeah. Um, and how God, oh, Joe's question, why does God fail to take into account the people's, he does take that into account. That's why he forgives us. He forgives us and gives us another chance. That's exactly it. Why, why does he, why does Moshe's prayer work? Because Moshe says, take into account, we're human. And God, and God, this is where God changes his relationship. With Midat Rachamin. So we have a good excuse, but but the good excuse doesn't make you a good nation. The good excuse gives you another chance to learn to be a good nation. Which having good, if you have a good excuse why I didn't uh, why I failed to test in medical school, I can get another I can, I can take the course over. That doesn't make me a doctor. I can't get a medical degree and graduate if I didn't pass the test. Even a good excuse is a reason to take the course again. Or take the test again, not a reason to give you a diploma. Um, because you had a good excuse why you mixed the test. I still have to finish the train, but I'll get more time to get it right the next time. If you take okay. 20 tests and keep on failing, that's something else. All right. I just put in, even though we haven't even uh we'll get the email later, but I just put in the details next week, of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, Rabbi Lee Tag will be speaking at 1225 as one of our seven speakers for our Purium Iyun. That's next Sunday. So I just you can click on the link there and you can register. To mention always, you'll need a separate registration link login for that program. And um, okay, we'll look forward to learning with you. As I mentioned, tomorrow night, Dr. Shapiro, Rabbi Shulman, Ray Health God, Susan Hornstein this week giving the Parsha Shear, a sitter on this uh, Shear and the Sitter, Rabbi Tabori's uh, concluding his uh, series on uh, halachi challenges in the state of Israel. So I've uh, got uh, lots to keep you busy this week, and uh, we share good things. And Rabbi, have a good flight back to Israel. Safe flight and Besorot uh, Tovat. Okay, uh, please invite a friend, and we look forward to learning with you in the near future. Have a good day. And of course, Benny Gazuntai, be Ivrit, be Od Arbaim Dakot, I'll say for Tilima Yomo Semis Mor Kuf Gimel. And one, of course, wish everybody Kodesh Tov, Mishanich Nasadar Marbi Besimcha. So let's hope we should have lots of Simcha in this month and uh, everybody be well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, bye bye.